Hey everybody, welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. Today we have a very, very special guest, Marty Bent, my friend and TFTC founder, um, Tales from the Crypt, one of the podcasts that first was part of Orange Pilling Me um, back in the day. Marty, thanks so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin layer. Well, Nick. Thank you for having me, and I'm humbled that TFTC was part of your your orange pilling journey. It was. It was. Uh, there were pretty much three podcasts early on that helped me understand what Bitcoin was and what Bitcoin was all about. One of them was yours. We just had Michael Goldstein on. I told him that the Noted podcast with him and Pierre Richard was one of the first ones as well. And then hearing Dr. Adam back on. Trace Mayer's podcast uh, back in the day. Those were kind of the three things that uh, really set me up, I think, for success in Bitcoin. So thank you for that. Marty is also involved in a mining company and the mining industry in general and speaks out about that. And he has his own uh, VC firm with a few other Bitcoiners called 1031. We're going to talk about all those things. So Marty, the first thing I want to ask you is about mining. What is happening in the Bitcoin mining space right now? We are hearing about bankruptcies and negative profitability with the price where it is and difficulty where it is. So what's going on? What do we need to know about mining right now? Long story short, it's a bit of a, a bloodbath. Uh, it's a, a combination of many things like, like you just mentioned. The price of Bitcoin is obviously significantly depressed from where it was this time last year. Uh, and at the same time, hash rate has increased materially over the last year as well. So the profitability of mining has been significantly compressed over the last 12 months. Um, like we mentioned last year, the price was hovering at all time highs around 60K, uh, probably around like 50, 45 to 50 this time last year. And what we saw happen this time last year is leading up to the chaos that we're seeing this year, which was there were a bunch of miners, private miners, publicly traded miners that were extremely bullish. And it's becoming apparent that they probably overextended themselves. A lot of uh, mistakes were made last year. The two main ones were miners just taking on too much debt at high cost of capital particularly miners who took out um, loans that were collateralized with their ASICs. Uh, I think that was probably the biggest lesson the mining industry is learning this year is that that's probably not the, the best way to uh, finance an operation. Uh, and for those who are unaware, uh, what you do is you put um, your ASICs up, some of your assets as collateral to get dollars um, to then go expand capacity or buy more ASICs. And what the market has come to find is that, I mean, we've known this for a while, but the lessons being driven home over the last 12 months is the the price of that, that collateral. The ASIC is tied very tightly to the price of Bitcoin. So if the price of Bitcoin collapses, the profitability of those ASICs collapses and uh, sort of the price and therefore the price of the collateral. So a lot of Individual mining companies that took out that type of debt uh, have found themselves underwater on those obligations. We just had um, big news drop today that NYDIG, uh, who was one of the companies giving out those types of loans, has essentially taken uh, the ASICs that were collateralized uh, in a loan that Greenwich, uh, the mining operation out of New York, had taken out. And NYDIG has essentially claimed they uh, brought those ASICs onto their balance sheet and they're now mining uh, with them for themselves and Greenwich is hosting. So Greenwich no longer holds those assets. They're, they're hosting them for NIDIG who now owns them. So that, that was a big, um, lesson learned as uh, it's probably not wise to attempt to grow your business using debt, particularly at a high cost of capital using collateral that's highly volatile and very tightly correlated with the price of Bitcoin. Uh, the second biggest thing, biggest lesson at, many miners have learned over the last year is futures orders is probably not a good idea either. Uh, there were a lot of people, including some of the companies I'm involved with that took out uh, futures orders from Bitmain 
uh, specifically last year where they, they launched their S19 XP and started taking money in for those towards the end of last year. And due to where the price of Bitcoin was and hash rate was, uh, they had to put up a significant amount of capital as a down payment. And those ASICs weren't delivered, didn't begin to get delivered until July of this year when the price of Bitcoin had fallen by 70%. And so you had that time cost of capital that was completely lost. You had to lock up uh, that down payment capital and then wait uh, seven to eight months for those ASICs to actually be delivered. And so many can make the argument that that capital was probably better spent paying down debt and um, just loading up the cash balance on your balance sheet. And so that's the second biggest problem, uh, the second biggest lesson that I've taken over the last year. And then thirdly, um, which is also very important is obviously with the inflationary environment that we're in, um, a lot of the individual miners who didn't have ironclad power purchase agreements and had variable electricity costs that were driven by the underlying energy inputs to that electricity, uh, they saw their rates go up, uh, which is just a compounding effect on the profit, the compressing profitability of mining. So you have, um, overextension of debt, uh, locking up capital with these futures orders, which turned out not to be wise, and then uh, rising electricity costs. And so, and then at the same time, hash rates coming on, a lot of people were deploying capital. And even though the price of Bitcoin was going on, they had to do something with their ASICs, so they plugged them in. Uh, and that just increases hash rate, makes mining less profitable, the price is going down. And so yeah, uh, very beautiful perfect storm of terrible events for the mining industry so small picture question and a big picture question small picture question is how do you feel about now nidig potentially becoming a major mining operator as they see, potentially seize a lot more asics and just get into the business that's the small picture the bigger picture here is what does all of this mean for the bitcoin for Bitcoin itself, because as our audience probably knows, when these miners go bankrupt, their machines get potentially turned off. Hash rate will then potentially come down and other participants will enter the network at that level and difficulty will find a base and everything will kind of proceed on. That's what happens in Bitcoin, right? Difficulty goes up, difficulty goes down. The market has to make all these adjustments with hardware, with electricity costs, um, with the Bitcoin price, and they have to factor it all in and, and, and there's a cycle to it here. So is this just part of the cycle? What does it mean for Bitcoin? What does it mean for the Bitcoin price? And how do you see the uh, mining industry evolve here? Are we going back to mom and pop type of thing? Are we going to still stay industrial? But certain people are getting uh, cleansed. What's going on? Anything. So we'll start with NIDIG. Uh, I, I think that was one of the looming questions in the mining industry specifically, uh, was like, how were these lenders who were taking ASICs as collateral going to act if those loans went underwater? I think this may be the first public instance of us finding out exactly how some of them are thinking, at least how NIDIG particularly is thinking, which is, hey, uh, we want to, we're re taking these ASICs as collateral, expecting revenues because they'd be plugged in producing Bitcoin that and would be able to pay down the loan. Now that the loan's underwater, they take them over. And that was a big question. What, what, what were these lenders going to do? Were they going to repossess and then try to sell them on the secondary market? Or were they going to try and find some hosting and just produce revenue? With those ASICs and that the latter seems to be <clears throat> what NIDIG is doing with this particular situation with Greenwich. And this may just be a very unique situation considering that Greenwich already had the infrastructure built out. They own and operate that, that power plant up in New York. I believe it's the New York power plant. Um, and so it, it created the environment for a pretty seamless transition, just switching the ownership of the ASICs from, from Greenwich to NIDIG so they can keep producing uh, revenue on, on that collateral. What NIDIG strategy, strategy is in the long term, who knows? Maybe they're just 
plugging them in or taking ownership of them and, and mining with them just to, to keep producing revenue to, to make sure that they get some return on the loans that they gave out. Uh, maybe they have a plan to, to sell the ASICs off and the hosting contracts off to other miners in the future. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what they plan to do, but if they really don't want to be in the, the business of owning and operating mining equipment, which is a very, it's, it's an operation that comes with a lot of risk and stress. Maybe they don't want that stress. Maybe they just want to produce revenue and then hand it off to somebody else in the future. Maybe they do want to take on uh, the operations. So time will tell what the overall strategy is. Yeah, maybe this particular Greenwich situation was uh, a perfect recipe to just make the seamless transition and others will turn out differently. Um, but yeah, no, it's a very interesting data point that we've been given this morning. Uh, and then in terms of overall market, yeah, I, th I think mining, uh, I think this is, is, these cleansing events are naturally um, going to distribute hash rate more granularly uh, among individual operators. And when you have the big guys getting into, into trouble, we I mean, had Compute North, who was the infrastructure company for, for Marathon, which is one of the largest miners. Um, going to bankruptcy, and I think Marathon's still trying to figure out to, what to do with that situation. So they have a lot of hash rate off of uh, offline. Then um, on top of that, you have Core Scientific, which is uh, the largest publicly traded mining company. Their their mix, I believe, is something like sixty forty uh, hosting for other people and then prop mining for themselves. They had jacked their rates up to ten cents a kilowatt hour. In some of their facilities earlier this year, which which made all of their customers unprofitable. So, what happens with those ASICs? Who knows? Uh, they may be sold off, and uh, there's rumors that Corsi may be in some trouble too. I mean, they publicly announced that they were going to stop paying some of their debt. Uh, they did have one of their um, one of their backers, one of their lenders, come out and say that they were going to extend them. I believe seventy two million dollars an additional capital to try and get them through this storm. Uh, who knows whether that will be successful, but yeah, I think overall this will help distribute hash rate more granularly. And I, I think maybe not the most obvious reason for that being is I think, again, going back to the lessons learned over the last year, a lot of what large miners have done over the last two years since the China or year and a half since the China ban is they've been building out, like mega farms, over 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts, Riot's building a, a gigawatt facility. And this takes a lot of time and upfront capital uh, to do. And I think there's a lesson being learned that that may not be the best strategy. Yes, once you finally get up and running and you have the economies to scale, uh, it does work out well for some of these companies. But again, the risk that you take on by losing all that time that it takes to build out that infrastructure, build out those substations, those transformers, the racks, the <clears throat> the the buildings that the the miners are housed in, uh, you're talking tens of millions of dollars, and usually eighteen to twenty four months, and that's eighteen to twenty four months that you're not producing revenue, um, so you have that massive sunk cost, and so I think one of the strategies that will be more popular coming out of the back end of this mining cycle will be smaller, more distributed mining operations. Maybe instead of building a hundred, 200, 400 megawatt gigawatt facility, you focus on the, the 10, 20, 50 megawatt size because you're able to put down less capital and build out that infrastructure uh, much more quickly. Instead of so, 18 to 24 months, you're talking eight to 12 weeks. Sure. And, Based on what you're describing here in the industry, is this middle of the bear market stuff or end of the bear market stuff? Because we know we're not at the start of the bear market. We've been in a bear market for, um, you know, a year now. But, uh, you know, what I it, without making some prediction on Bitcoin price, like what type of activity uh, are we seeing here? Yeah. <sighs> I hope it's the end of the bear market, but I don't know for sure. We could be in a an extended bear market that goes well beyond a year, hovers into two years right around the next halving. I'm not saying that the halving is a forcing function, but just looking historically on 
Bitcoin bear markets, they've they've varied. And that's what I'm really asking last. you here is that with the mining, you know, sector kind of in total disarray as you describe it, is that the recipe for another 12 months of kind of grinding through and trying to figure out where the hash rate will settle in, where minor profitability will settle in as you as you describe, you know, maybe start to distribute some of this hash rate. Yeah. Yeah, it could, um, it could yeah, it could, it, where it ends up, who knows for sure. Let's just look at the indicators that we do have. I mean, top of the line machines right now, excluding the XP and the M50S, which are top of top of the line. If we're talking S19J Pros, M30S Pluses, they're hovering around $10 a terahash, like 10 to $13 a terahash. And you compare this to last year when they were hovering around $85, $90 a terahash. So they've had uh, a significant decline in their overall value. Um, so if you're just looking at indicators, like how much lower can that go? I'm not sure. We'll, we'll go to $5 a terahash. I would find that hard to believe. I, I think if it approached those levels, you'd have some distressed funds coming in and scooping up all those assets because the deals would just be so uh, appeasing. Um, so if you're looking at price per terahash for the ASICs right now, they are significantly depressed and to the point where uh, it may be appeasing to a, a distressed fund or somebody who's looking to take advantage of distressed assets. And so that can create a floor there. And then if you're getting them that cheap uh, and you're able to find cheap electricity below five cents, you can plug those in automatically and probably get a quick uh, return on those, even in in this environment um, with the price hovering around 17k. Uh, yeah, and then the the other the other thing to consider is is you know, everything going on in the global macro environment. Like, who's going to make a bet that this market's going to turn, considering the crazy craziness going on with the Bank of Japan just uh, instituting their new yield curve control policy late last night. Uh, are there people out there who are going to take bets that, hey, this may turn around because the um, the markets outside of Bitcoin may be forced to turn around? Um, but again, that's a bet that comes with risk. Yeah, uh, and so mac uh, macro coming into the picture there, but uh, this is why the Bitcoin layer is having people on as guest lecturers. That's what you guys are representing here. And so what M Uncle Marty is teaching us is that price per terahash is a good metric that we need to incorporate into our framework to understand where the value of Bitcoin is. So one of the things we're doing is we're trying to develop a fair valuation framework for Bitcoin just based on long-term moving average, realized cap, and and hash rate and difficulty and the mining side of things. So, you know, what we what we have to understand is that there is a dollar cost to the mining that involves the machines, the difficulty, the market, and also um, the electricity cost. And so there is a formula that spits out a number that the 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 la the miner of last resort is going to come in and buy that machine and turn the power on as long as they have cheap enough power. And so we have to understand these internal metrics to determine that okay, this is where Bitcoin's fair value is. And if there are players willing to make certain bets here, this is a good risk reward level for those mining operations to take. So we appreciate you giving us that color. Uh, I want to move away from mining now to TFTC. This is Tales from the Crypt. Uh, you started as a pod, but I see you now describing it as a Bitcoin media company. So what is it like building and operating a Bitcoin media company? Um, this is a more personal question now because that's pretty much what we're doing at the Bitcoin layer. We consider ourselves more of a research provider than media, but the the line is blurred. So, what's it like, Marty? It's it's a lot of fun. So, it actually, we start the newsletter started first in June of 2017. Marty's bent, and then we 
spun uh, TFTC up in September uh, of 2017. September 2018, we added Rabbit Hole Recap, which is um, separate from TFTC, but sort of part of this amorphous family that we've built. And yeah, when I when I describe TFTC as a as a media company focused on Bitcoin beauty and freedom in the digital age. Uh, it's grown to attack all these different mediums where you have written content, which is sent directly to people's inboxes. And then we have a website where it's syndicated as well. Uh, obviously, we have the podcast. Uh, and then we do our, our podcast uh, in video format too. So we put that on YouTube, Bitcoin TV, Rumble. And so the different mediums of the media industry, we, we hit them all in terms of written audio, video. And then specifically when I say Bitcoin media company, yes, most of the content that we produce is focused strictly on Bitcoin, what's going on in the network, why it's an important uh, innovation in the digital, digital age, some of the philosophy, um, some of the economic philosophy behind it and just philosophical musings behind it. We touch on all that, but uh, there's another pun intended layer to um, the calling TFTC a Bitcoin media company is something I'm extremely passionate about is running a media company on a Bitcoin standard, like literally embedding Bitcoin revenue streams into everything we do. Uh, and so when I talk about building a Bitcoin media company, it's it's dual purpose. We're going to produce content that helps people learn about Bitcoin and better understand it. But then we're going to try and practice what we preach. We believe in Bitcoin. We believe it's the best money ever. We believe um, technologies like the Lightning Network enable things at the payments layer that have never been possible and so we want to prove that out with our technology stack as well and so this is um the way we do this right now is really focused on the written and the audio content so the written content uh the newsletter goes out via ghost which is an open source cms that competes with uh, wordpress and you can also say it competes with companies like Substack that are producing um, platforms where people can easily create newsletters um, and host them there. Um, but we chose to go with Ghost because it's open source and you can really um, manipulate the code and, and build things that you want to see uh, incorporated into your newsletter and website. And obviously one of the things we've wanted to see incorporated is, is the ability to donate in Bitcoin, pay for things in Bitcoin um, and, um, basically just use Bitcoin to interact with our content. And so we built a BTC pay server integration for Ghost specifically for TFTC, where we basically are combining two open source projects with Ghost, the CMS and BTC pay server, the open source payments, Bitcoin payment processor. Uh, and so we've built a lot of scripts that allow BTC pay server and Ghost to interact with each other. Uh, and so we can use ghost to create paywalls that are payable over the lightning network using btc pay server we have donation buttons we have shout outs for rabbit hole recap that are only payable in bitcoin uh, and so that that's uh, on the written side of things that's how we want to build a bitcoin media company is like here we want to sort of show the way of like all right if you really want to monetize the media that you're making with Bitcoin, here's how you do it. And we built this integration with BT Space Server and Ghost. If you're sending out a newsletter, building a website, here's how you can do it very easily. Um, and the beauty of Ghost to BTC Pay Server, you can have very granular control over it. You can self host Ghost, you can self host your BTC Pay Server. And so you can literally create a, a media property that you control. There's no Visa, MasterCard, Substack in the middle of you and your audience they're they're contributing sats to what you're doing it's going directly to a to a node that you control um so that's the written side of things and then podcast gets into audio and obviously shout out to adam curry and the podcasting 2.0 team they've created a great way to embed a lightning network public address into your podcast rss feed so that anybody who's listening via a podcasting 2.0 enabled application which is essentially um, a podcasting app that has a bitcoin lightning network wallet embedded into it um, you can begin syndicating your content out uh, obviously to itunes spotify your regular podcast players but then 
these podcasting 2.0 enabled apps will pick it up and will allow your audience to stream you sats per minute they listen or boost um, a particular part of the episode that they like. So again, on the audio side of things, um, that's how we're incorporating Bitcoin into into that particular vertical is leveraging podcasting 2.0 to enable us to monetize via our audience who wants to contribute to the show. Um, and then the third leg, which we haven't figured out yet, but want to focus on it in 2023 is, is video. How do you create super chat like functions for live streams or make it e- easy for people who are watching uh, on YouTube or other video platforms to, to stream us sats or send us sats if they want to. And so yeah, uh, the Bitcoin media company is a company focused on Bitcoin content, but then really trying to pave the way on how you you monetize your your media company with with bitcoin specifically and so that's one thing i hope when i'm able to look back decades from now what did tftc accomplish we uh, showed people the way of how to basically bitcoinize your your media company in the future a bitcoin media company won't be a media company particularly focused on producing bitcoin content it will be any media company um focused on any content vertical they're just able to monetize via bitcoin via some of the tools that we've built and i strongly recommend the tftc ecosystem and model for our audience to go pursue Uh, what marty is building with tftc is an operation that can deliver or that does deliver very intense information about what is going on in Bitcoin, the industry all across and the technology involved in it. One of my favorite things that you guys have is the rabbit hole recap that brings in Matt O'Dell, who has a a very security focused approach to Bitcoin always has. And both of them offer great insights as to what is going on on the tech side. And what Marty is covering also includes economic philosophy behind Bitcoin itself. It's something different than what we do at TBL. And I really do recommend people that are really interested in what I would consider an intense Bitcoin experience to go seek that through TFTC. Um, One of the things that you've covered, Marty, this year, and we have to go back and talk about this is you identified SBF as a total spook <laughs> a while back. So tell our audience, what did what were some of the early things that you actually wrote about him or tweeted about him? When was this? How did you know this guy was a spook? What was your worst nightmare for covering uh, after covering him and seeing what he was doing? And, you know, just bring us up to speed. Yeah, SBF. So I, I think the first instance where I sort of raised my eyebrow, I was like, why is, is FTX over the last three years has really garnered this reputation that they were the creme de la creme of the, the crypto industry and that Sam Bankman Freed was this wonderkind who was going to be the next uh, JP Morgan. And I mean, obviously I'm focused on Bitcoin, Bitcoin only, FTX was running um uh, a uh, margin trading exchange we can margin trade bitcoin and and shit coins as well so I, I never really i never signed up for ftx never used ftx i never really was interested in interacting with them but again obviously uh being on social media i see all these different people talking about him and holding him up on this pedestal and i never really dug into him and wasn't really trying to dig into him i think i just saw a clip of him on CNBC last July, so July 2021, where he was on with Joe Kernan on whatever show they do in the morning. And uh, it was the topic of the conversation was the energy intensity of proof of work versus proof of stake. And made about a five minute conversation on that topic. And while listening to that, I forget exactly what he said, but it became very apparent to me that he either completely misunderstood the nature of proof of work or how Bitcoin actually works or was being extremely disingenuous and self-serving um, by portraying Bitcoin's proof of work mechanism in the light that he was. And so I think I sent a tweet out uh, that day 
with that video is just like I don't, I don't understand why everybody thinks this guy is a genius he, he clearly doesn't understand proof of work or the beauty of proof of work or how it actually works and if you're going to be this wonderkind this cryptocurrency expert that is one of the sharpest minds in the industry you would expect him to understand proof of work um, which is one of the main innovations proof of work with a difficulty adjustment particularly is like the special sauce that makes bitcoin work and makes this this network so beautiful uh so yeah that was the first alarm bell that went off in my mind was just like this guy doesn't understand the topic he's supposed to be an expert in so i called him out then and then he kept on um he kept moving forward obviously he was getting close with dc and lobbying on behalf of proof of stake over proof of work, I think he blocked me after uh, the first tweet I sent. So all the information I got from him on Twitter after that was just screenshots of, of things he were doing. And yeah, FTX was lobbying Congress to position proof of stake as the consensus mechanism that uh, they should be allowing because of proof of work's energy intensity. I called him out again then. And then uh, fast forward to, I believe, February or late January of this year when he had his conference down in the bahamas and his two uh, keynote speakers were tony blair and bill clinton and it was just like at that point i was like it's it's obvious that this guy is <laughs> connected in a weird way and, and is not really here to serve the purposes or the ideals that bitcoin strives for um or even that crypto quote-unquote crypto pretends to um uh, strive for and he it seemed very obvious to me that he was self-serving and trying to um, benefit him and his company over the overall benefit of the market and Bitcoin and, and even quote unquote crypto to an extent. And then you add on the massive marketing spend out of nowhere and being able to name stadiums, have Super Bowl commercials, have his billboard billboards up all across the world with his face on it. And it's just, it never made sense to me that this little, prop exchange that spun up a few years ago was able to attain that um, that type of marketing spend, that type of valuation, and these types of connections without something being weird. I will say I was never, I wasn't as ardent, I wasn't like the uh, Cajotes or whatever, the short seller who's been like calling it fraud. I, I honestly never dug that deep in. My bullshit meter just went off and honestly, I just disregarded them. Um, and every once in a while, I'd see something you say, like, yeah, why is anybody paying attention to this idiot? And and so it really is crazy how um, it all exploded all at once. And people, you know, I had seen things that he was talking about, and I tend to ignore, you know, if you're talking about the benefits of proof of stake versus proof of work, um, I consider that as well, just like you it's either dis disingenuous or just you just don't understand the economics and why I'm involved. So then I tend to block it out and then it, and it, it, it completely explodes in everyone's face. You mentioned Bill Clinton. I got to, I got to bring up um, something else you've covered this year extensively, which is Epstein and Maxwell and the tie in to the world economic form how does all of this impact Bitcoin? Why do you care about it so much? And is it part of what you describe as the economic philosophy that we have to consider um, power power players, uh, you know, on the global scale? So the way I think all that stuff fits into Bitcoin is I don't think it has, maybe it does to some extent have a direct effect, but if it does, it's m minimal and uh, at least they, the most they could do is slow down Bitcoin adoption. Um, I don't think it has nothing like the World Economic Forum is going to be able to successfully attack Bitcoin. And what I actually think, I think it's it's everything that's gone on with Epstein, the Orwellian overreach of the Davos class at the World Economic Forum, the Orwellian overreach of Western democracies like the U.S. and Canada, and others. What it does is just hi it acutely highlights. Bitcoin's value prop and why it's so important as we transition into the digital age. You have, whether it be the World Economic Forum, the U.S. federal government, the Canadian federal government, or who knows, I, people will 
people will say they're all working together and it's some big master plan. Who knows if there's some big master plan or not? Objectively, we're going to look at the results of their policies and their posturing. And I think any level-headed individual would be able to agree that it has not resulted in material benefit for humanity. Is definitely benefited a very select few at the expense of of the masses. And so I think if anything, Epstein, the World Economic Forum, it just all the the shady stuff that goes on with these entities and these different stories that pop up just highlights that we lived in a two that we live in a two tiered society where you have these this unproductive class that really doesn't get their hands dirty and produce the the things that make the world go around. They just have access to a lot of the capital and particularly the money printer. And they have very close proximity to the money printer. And um, on top of that, uh, a lot of influence at the political level to, so that they can get by with their crimes. And I, I think that is the number one thing that these people do. I actually think it's a, and it's a benefit to Bitcoin overall because it, they, seem to not be able to control themselves in terms of trying to control us. And it's becoming more and more obvious that uh, the unproductive class as represented by the World Economic Forum and uh, the Epsteins of the world just it doesn't have the common man's best interest in mind. And uh, they're able to control the common man because they have control of this global financial system and a lot of the, the political apparatus that exists. And it, again, acutely highlights Bitcoin's value prop is we can remove these centralized actors from uh, our monetary lives, specifically from the monetary system, from monetary policy. And from there, we can begin to re-architect society in a way that's more fair, more open, more transparent. Um, It's not going to be equitable. Uh, Equity is never going to exist, but at least it creates the conditions where everybody knows the rules, knows what's going on, and then you can operate knowing that you're everybody else is operating on the same playing field. And I think what we'll find is that we have a a much fairer society and and one that isn't controlled by a select few. And how do what else do you, what else do you describe as the economic philosophy of Bitcoin? Because what you, you know, what you've described thus far is how Bitcoin paves the way for a more fair, open and transparent system what else is there that goes along with that um, in terms of maybe Bitcoin's properties or the people that are building Bitcoin tools, you know, the things that they're doing as well. Yeah. When I, the way I like to still, you just juxtapose Bitcoin, the monetary system with the global financial fiat system controlled by central banks and governments and just take it back to basics and nature and, there's like information theory, like the like nature is emergent. Complex systems are emergent. Monetary systems should be emergent, but they're not. They're they're centrally controlled, centrally planned by a very select few amount of individuals on this planet, and that central control does not allow emergent order to take place, and this leads to the negative externalities. That we see again the, the two tier society that has been erected around that that central control of the monetary system. When it comes to like Bitcoin economic philosophy, really steeped um, heavily in Austrian economics, which is driven by praxology and, and human nature and human action. Bitcoin, just the way the system works, creates the conditions from which emergent order can actually arise um, due to the fact that anybody can download a full node, download some wallet software, send and receive Bitcoin without any central authority perturbing that uh, interaction if they're using Bitcoin correctly. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, when I like to keep it simple in terms of describing Bitcoin's economic philosophy. It's steeped in Austrian principles, obviously, but even lower than that, it just allows emergent order to take place in a world that is very centrally controlled and trying to perturb emergent order. Uh, going to put you on the spot here. Give me one country that's not in Latin America or Central America. So let's exclude the hyperinflation that ha- that's happened in a few select South American countries. And let's exclude El Salvador for a second. 
give me one country that you are very excited about the Bitcoin adoption path that you're seeing right now. I think Southeast Asia is actually an area of the world in terms of coverage of Bitcoin adoption that's blowing up right now. The Philippines and Thailand. Um, from what I understand, the Philippines has a, a crazy amount of activity going on, particularly with remittance and payments over the Lightning Network. That's one uh, sort of UX theme that arose over in Asia before it became more popular here in the US because of COVID, which is the interaction with QR codes um, and the amount of individuals who are adopting uh, smartphones over in, the, in Southeast Asia is going exponential. Um, and then they're very, from what I understand, their economies are very cash driven. And as we transition to the digital world, that's changing uh, a bit. And it, it seems natural that, that Bitcoin um, is going to proliferate there. It seems to be happening um, as well pretty rapidly and under the radar, actually. Um, there's a lot of, particularly the Philippines, um, with, uh, with remittances. Excellent. And good timing for the Thai translation of layered money, which is scheduled to be released, uh, in early 2023. So, and the, the interest in Thailand is also something that uh, I've recognized as well with, uh, readership and, um, you just see a lot of energy around Bitcoin itself, nothing crypto. I don't hear anything crypto really out of Thailand. So it's all about Bitcoin. Um, Marty, what's it like being a Bitcoin dad? Uh, you have, <laughs> you have young children and you have to start teaching them real things about money as they come of age. What are you, what's it like being a Bitcoin dad? And what are some of the, uh, not necessarily challenges, but what are the things that you're excited to teach your kids early on before they can understand complex, uh, economic philosophy? Yeah, we're not at the point yet where we're giving out allowances. So my oldest is almost three. My youngest is six month, <laughs> six months old. Um, so, uh, just get, so right now we're I'm obviously not at the point where I can teach them like economic philosophy or like the theories of money. We're still counting up into the high twenties, getting, getting that base layer knowledge of understanding numbers and in order. But, uh, I think, Personally, as somebody like as a Bitcoin dad who runs a company, partner at a VC firm, and runs another, is a partner in a mining company as well. That's one thing. Maybe it's not directly related to Bitcoin, but it's just um, trying to make sure that I'm there to be a good father with all these responsibilities. So taking time out of my day, out of my week to make sure I'm dedicating uh, the necessary. The, t the time that's necessary to be a good father, um, which is something you have to be cognizant of, as I'm sure you're very aware of as well. Is it's the wild west out there in Bitcoin. There's a lot of us who are out there trying to build companies, take advantage of opportunities, just get Bitcoin to a place where it's massively successful, um, and that takes a lot of dedication. But um, being a father, it's uh, being very focused on balancing. The dedication to the companies and the overall pro proliferation of Bitcoin and, and making sure that you're there for your children and your wife, um, uh, helping out and, and being a good father figure and actually practicing what you preach, um, which is a lot of what I talk about on the show and in the newsletter is making sure that we build strong families and um, we have uh, good parents in the home. And so I would would hate it if I turned into some workaholic that um, was just an absentee father who got consumed with all the Bitcoin stuff that I'm doing, which many people, you can see how it can happen. I've certainly let it happen to me in spurts. But um, yeah, being a Bitcoin dad, particularly building things in the space, it's trying to be aware and intentional about the, the work-life balance so they can be a good dad. So try to work from home as much as possible. Um, I make breakfast, um, uh, take my son to school. If there's a day in the week where I'm not that busy, I'll stay home, take over some of the responsibilities of taking care of the young ones and then always making sure as much as possible 
maybe once a week or once every other week. I'm not home for bedtime, but being home for uh, dinner, bed, bath, books, um, and just trying to be a good dad. Excellent. Yeah, I I absolutely cherish uh, the morning commute when I can when I can do that as well. Those are some of the best conversations that you can have. Uh, it's just taking your kid or kids to school. Uh, so I definitely appreciate that. Marty, what you're building 1031. Tell us quickly about 1031, who else is involved with you, and what are some of the companies, projects, or, or sectors that you're really, really excited about heading into 2023, young projects that you're excited to get going? Uh, so 1031 uh, joined as a venture partner Last year, 1031 was founded by uh, two cousins, Grant Gilliam and Jonathan Kirkwood, um, who have been uh, basically allocating in the space for the last few years. Uh, last year, we went and we raised low time preference fund two, which is when I joined with um, Matt O'Dell, my business partner, at Rapidal Recap, and very good friend of Michael Tanguma, um, who's also part of Unchained. And so it's uh, the team's there's six of us right now on the core team and we're essentially a venture fund that uh, is de dedicated to investing in Bitcoin only infrastructure historically uh, over the last five to seven years, particularly a lot of venture funds have spun up and, and raised billions of dollars of capital, but they've been focused on, on crypto, on investing in token projects and, uh, DeFi scams to to get a quick 100x return and not really focus on on the longevity longevity of this ecosystem. They're really focused on quick returns, and there's been a a very uh, very stark uh, lack of investment in Bitcoin only infrastructure. And so 1031, that is our mission: is to uh, raise capital and deploy capital uh, on uh, into companies that are dedicated in transitioning the world to a Bitcoin standard. And that's, uh, that happens by building, building out tools, whether it be security, um, custody, uh, hardware, mining, uh, lightning network, uh, companies, uh, been uh, companies that leverage the lightning network. So yeah, that's why we exist is because we we've noticed that there's been an obscene, literally obscene. It's disgusting how much capital has been raised and dedicated to, uh, the siren call of crypto uh, and the very small amount of capital to date that's been raised for Bitcoin only infrastructure. And so that's why we exist is to support uh, founders who, who we align with philosophically. We all believe that we're going to transition to a Bitcoin standard and to get there, we're going to need infrastructure. We're going to need tools. We're going to need products. We're going to need applications um, to make Bitcoin more accessible for the common man so that's where our focus is in terms of uh, next year, what we're looking forward to. I think Lightning Network this year has hit a sort of breakaway, has hit a escape velocity in terms of people finally being like, all right, this is here to stay and we can build a lot of cool stuff on it. So next year, I think uh, we'll see the, the product of the validation of, of Lightning Network uh, turn into more products coming to market. Um, I think remittance is still uh, a big, big problem that's getting solved. And I think we'll see a lot of activity there. Podcasting 2.0 obviously leverages the Lightning Network. I think we're going to see similar products dedicated to other types of, of content and art um, that spin out and sort of look at what Podcasting 2.0 has done and applies that to other mediums like music uh, and art which is going to be cool. But I think the thing I'm most bullish on is custody. I think the, um, I, I'm right down the hall from Unchained Capital here at the Bitcoin Commons in Austin and they're a 1031 portfolio company that we're very excited to back. Uh, they've been a supporter of TFTC for years before I even joined 1031. I think uh, even though they're not um, a, an early stage startup, they're more established and have been around for a while. I'm very excited uh, to see what 2023 brings for Unchained and companies like Unchained that are trying to leverage Bitcoin's native properties to develop this financial system uh, on a Bitcoin standard. And for those who are unaware, Unchained leverages multi-sig to, to, make, to make it so people 
individuals can can hold their Bitcoin in a multi-sig quorum with a partner like Unchained, still control their Bitcoin, but have somebody helping them out. And then uh, on top of that, two or three multi-sig structure building financial products like loans, IRAs, and other things. And I think the lesson of 2022 is not your keys, not your coins. These trusted third-party custodians cannot be trusted with your Bitcoin. They've proven time and time and time again over the last 14 years to either gamble away your Bitcoin or just be insecure with their architecture and lose your Bitcoin. And there's a way that you can prevent that using Bitcoin's native multi-sig properties, which is creating these key quorums. And I think that that will be a big theme as we head into 2023 is the industry really looking internally and saying, hey, uh, we have the tools at our at our hands to actually build uh, our financial products and our custody that allows customers and ourselves to have certainty that we're not going to lose Bitcoin. So if you put your Bitcoin, uh, let's say you get a loan out and you're using Bitcoin as collateral, that should be set up in a two or three multi-sig where you hold one key, you can't move that Bitcoin, but since you hold that one key, you have visibility into the the collateral escrow account and you know your Bitcoin's not being lent out on the back end to the three arrows capitals of the world or the Celsius of the world or uh, degenerate traders. You know that your, your Bitcoin's safe in that multi-sig. You can check the chain by yourself using your own node if you want to. Uh, and I think in 2023, that's going to be a theme that begins to get legs is, hey, we have this new technology that allows us to re-architect these um, consumer cust- uh, custodian models that, that gives the consumer uh, a bit more certainty that, that their money is not being messed with. And I, I think we're going to see a lot of products that begin leveraging multi-sig more and more. One, because it's the right thing to, to, to do um, to give your customers certainty. And then two, as a business, like it, it just it's going to de-risk your operations as well because you're not even going to be allowed to be tempted to, to gamble away your users' deposits. What about the new uh, legislation that's been proposed in the Senate? Um, it's my baseline kind of immediate prediction that a lot of the worst stuff won't make it into the final version. Maybe I'm just being an extreme optimist. What are your thoughts? I mean, if we're just looking at Senator Warren's track record of actually getting bills passed, it's pretty abysmal. I think it's like 0.1% of all the bills she's ever proposed have actually been passed. I mean, as written, I find it very unlikely that it does get passed. But even if it does uh, get cut down and uh, some less potent version of the bill does get passed, but it's still um, a bit burdensome for Bitcoiners, yeah, it could stink in the short term. But one thing that I'm actually bullish on I don't know if bullish is the right word, but a theme that I think is going to play out over the next many years that began playing out uh, over COVID is individual, particularly here in the United States, is individual states asserting their autonomy from the federal government. So if the federal government does come out with some onerous laws around uh, registering as a, a money transmitter or a financial services business, if you're running a node or a minor if that does ever pass, or if you have something where um, you're trying to force citizens to register their Bitcoin addresses, I wouldn't be surprised if that does get passed. But you see at the state level, states like here in Texas, Wyoming, uh, Tennessee, Florida, where the state just says, hey, we're not, we're not going to force our citizens to do this. I think we're going to see that theme of, of states sort of nagging the federal government saying, hey, you're, you're overstepping. Your boundary, the boundaries here, uh, I think that's going to pick up. I think the 10th Amendment is going to be leaned on heavily as we head closer to 2030, and um, particularly as it pertains to Bitcoin regulation, because at the end of the day, everything proposed in that bill, uh, it, it goes against the bill's Bill of Rights. I mean, you can make a very strong argument that Bitcoin is protected by the First Amendment. It's speech is just text at the end of the day. Uh, and even if that doesn't pass, you can go to the Fourth Amendment, uh, unreasonable search and seizure. The government does not need to know all the information about you and your Bitcoin holdings. Privacy isn't a bad thing. That's one thing that this bill uh, is trying to sort of say. It's like, oh, why why are you hiding? What do you have to hide? It's that sort of old trope. 
Uh, and that's another sort of narrative that we need to begin beating the drum in Bitcoin. It's like privacy is not a bad thing. Crime is a bad thing. Obviously, yes, but uh, we just need better uh, police officers and better investigators to actually go stop the crime. And that's uh, laws like the ones that Senator Warren wants to pass. That's another thing. It's like all anti-money anti -money laundering, KYC, sort of tracking everybody. Like all that does is, is harm the individual Bitcoin user, the individual law-abiding citizen because criminals are going to criminal it doesn't like criminals break laws no matter what you can write uh, any laws that you want a criminal if he wants to he or she wants to do something is going to do it irregardless of the law but if these laws do get passed and individuals are forced to go along with them particularly as it pertains to personal identifying information and having third parties like bitcoin exchanges or mining pools uh attempt to uh, secure that data. History has shown time and time again that, that these companies are not good at securing data. So it actually puts the individual, particularly in a Bitcoin, uh, an individual holding Bitcoin at undue risk. Because if you write these laws and force people to keep people's home addresses and then uh, associate those home addresses with their Bitcoin addresses, that's just a, a huge honeypot of information where if criminals wanted to get access to that, find out who has Bitcoin, where they live, and how much Bitcoin they have, that puts individuals in physical harm, uh, in danger of physical harm. So um, that was a long-winded answer to, yeah, could get passed, but I think states will fight back against it. And then even if it does get passed, we need to have a larger conversation as Americans where this is an egregious affront to our civil liberties. And these laws... The KYC AML laws that stem from the Bank Secrecy Act have done nothing but harm individuals. They've done nothing to stop crime. Jeffrey Epstein had a bank account with J.P. Morgan in Deutsche Bank and was wiring hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, after being sentenced um, for trafficking humans. HSBC was creating uh, teller windows specifically designed for the Mexican drug cartels. I think the, the people that are supposed to abide by these laws uh, of anti money and KYC are often breaking them and it's harming the individual. Christine Lagarde, she's a convicted criminal. She laundered, misappropriated French taxpayer money on behalf of Nicolas Sarkozy. These people don't have a leg to stand on. Love it, Marty. Tremendous insights today. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us at the Bitcoin layer. Give people where to find you and you know, I give my personal recommendation for TFTC and rabbit hole recap, just because you are going to get such a wide range of Bitcoin and economic philosophy um, from Marty and, and Matt as well. So tell us where to find all your stuff, Marty. You can go to TFTC.io if you want to sign up for the newsletter. You can do that there. If you search for TFTC in your podcasting app, uh, you should find the interview series there and then Rabbit Hole Recap, which is the weekly show that we do. Um, you can search that in your podcasting app as well. And then if you're interested in better understanding 1031, our philosophy and some of the companies we invest in, our website's 1031.vc. Uh, we post content there and then obviously have our portfolio. So if you're interested in learning more about the Bitcoin companies that we're excited about, uh, you can go to 1031.vc. Great. Thanks, Marty. Uh, this is the Bitcoin layer. We are sponsored by Voltage, enterprise-grade Bitcoin infrastructure. Marty, Ben, thank you so much again. Nick, it's always a pleasure.